this is one of the driest places on, on Earth. Sometimes it feels like being on the moon or Mars. During the day is a fantastic place, but during the night is absolutely astonishing. Hi everybody, welcome back to the journey through the extreme universe. Today we are here to celebrate the Dark Matter Day, which actually is happening on Sunday, but we couldn't wait to talk about this mysterious component of the universe. So in this webinar, we are going to learn what we know so far about dark matter and something that we don't know is its nature. A way to disentangle this mystery uh, is observing gamma rays. So we are going to learn also, thanks to our speakers, how CTA is going to try to unravel the nature of dark matter. And as I said, we have today speakers in plural. We don't have just one mission commander today. We have with us three mission commanders that I'm going to introduce in just one minute. But as usual, I always give you this reminder if you have any comments, questions, if you want to say hi to us, you can do it already in the comments on Facebook and YouTube. At the end, we always have this question and answer session. So if you have a question about dark matter and you never knew to who should ask, this is your moment. Don't be shy. Send your, your questions. The speakers will answer it at the end. So with that, let me introduce, let me welcome the speakers. We have today here Javier, Mabel and Judith. Hi, guys. How are you? Hi, everybody. Hi. So first of all, thank you for joining us uh, today in this special webinar, actually, because it's the first time, as I said, that we have uh, several people, several speakers. Today, Javier is going to give this historical scientific context on, on dark matter. Then Mabel will talk about the dark matter sources we have in our own galaxy. And then Judith will talk about the dark matter sources that are far away in the extragalactic universe, actually the universe we discussed in the previous webinar. Uh, before starting, uh, I would like to introduce you to the audience. I'm going to do it in, in order. Let's start with Javier. Javier is an astrophysicist working at the Institute for Theoretical Physics in Madrid, who actually recently defended successfully his PhD on searches for dark matter subhalos with gamma rays using the satellite Fermilab and the observatory CTO. Then we have Mabel. She's also a doctor in astrophysics, currently working uh, as a postdoc at the University of Padova here in Italy. Her work has been centered in the development of software for the analysis of the data from the CTO's large size telescope. And she also worked in the studies of prospect for the detection of dark matter uh, with CTO. And finally, we have Judith. She is a PhD in her final, in her last year, also at the Institute for Theoretical Physics in Madrid. And most of her time uh, has been devoted to model the dark matter content with CTO, mostly for these extragalactic objects she will talk about. So again, thanks for joining us. And let's start today with Javier. Javier, whenever you want. Thank you very much, Alba, and thanks to the audience for being here in this very exciting uh, webinar. So today we're going to talk a bit about dark matter and how can uh, CTA say something, maybe, about uh, this mysterious component. So the first thing to talk about here is the evidence we have uh, for dark matter. We don't know, actually, what dark matter is, the, its ultimate nature, but we have a lot of evidence of its existence. Actually, this is a long-standing mystery in modern physics because we have evidence since the early 1930s. So we are uh, approaching uh, dangerously uh, uh, a se its centenary. So yeah, it's, it's a, a very long-standing mystery here. And we have evidence for an invisible matter component in the universe that it's five times more abundant than ordinary matter. We understand by ordinary matter everything we know, basically. And some of these evidence um, can be found in the uh, galactic rotation curves, the galaxy cluster dynamics, and very famously, the cosmic microwave background anisotropy, which is the rightmost uh, graphic here. You will for sure know. So now we have the evidence. It's interesting to, to talk about uh, what do we know actually about dark matter in, the, in this next slide. And, um, 
what we know about dark matter is um, these three things. We know a lot of things, but mainly uh, this uh, mysterious component is electrically neutral, and this means that it doesn't emit or reflect light, so it's very difficult to detect. We cannot uh, just look at it in principle. It's extremely weakly interacting at most. Maybe it's not interacting at all with ordinary matter. This is also a problem because we know ordinary matter, we don't know dark matter. And uh, finally, it's collisionless. This means that dark matter is almost unperturbed. It's very difficult to uh, see its effect on, on, on itself. So this makes its detection very, very difficult because uh, main points, it is invisible and it only interacts gravitationally with its surroundings. It is very useful to obtain evidence of its existence, but doesn't tell us anything or practically anything about its ultimate nature. Now, um, in this last, mm, say, 100 years, more or less, uh, physicists have been very, very, very busy developing models for dark matter. We don't know what it is, but we have a lot of um, nice ideas. Uh, in this graphic here in this plot, we can see some of the just most popular models for dark matter. I don't know the number, it's, <laughs> I don't know, 100, 1000, whatever you want, models for dark matter. And we are a bit lost actually, because they span more than 60 orders of magnitude in mass. Just to have a taste of what does this mean, we have particles in these models as light as actions, which have masses of a billionth of the electron, so extremely, extremely light, up to very macroscopic candidates, such as primordial black holes, which cannot be considered just an elementary particle, but a macroscopic object. And they can be as heavy as hundreds of times the mass of the sun. So we are talking here about extremely uh, heavy objects. So we have a huge range from the billionth of the mass of the electron to hundreds of times the mass of the sun. And everything is permitted in principle. Dark matter, it's uh, very flexible in, in this sense. So uh, you may ask now, okay, uh, why are we talking about dark matter if it's invisible, if we cannot uh, see it actually with a telescope? Well, fortunately, there are some models, some very, very uh, interesting models in which dark matter can interact very weakly. Remember I said uh, at most it can interact very, very weakly with ordinary matter, but this is, interaction is enough for, for our purposes. Why? Because in these interactions, as you can see in this plot at the right, at the right hand side, you have two dark matter particles, okay, these blue, blue balls, and they uh, interact, they collide, producing in this process uh, a standard model particles, so ordinary matter, particles we all know and love, such as quarks, bosons, etc. And uh, as a byproduct, as a bonus, you get a lot of particles from these, from these ones. Uh, namely, you get, as you can see, there are positrons, electrons, neutrinos, etc. And also photons. Photons are light, of course. And you have low and medium gamma ray photons. They can also be high energy gamma ray photons. So if we are dealing with gamma rays, we have CTAO. So we have the, 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 the best instrument possible to, to take a look. Now, uh, how do we take a look at this, uh, at this dark matter annihilation, let's say, these dark matter processes which produce actually this gamma ray? Well, each gamma ray source, each astrophysical source, actually, regardless of the wavelength, is characterized by its spectrum. The spectrum, just to have a taste, is like a unique fingerprint for each source, okay? We have our fingerprints, and they tell us, I am Javier, you are whoever you are, okay, by your fingerprint, a source is exactly the same. Each source has its unique spectrum, its unique fingerprint. As you can see in this plot here on the right hand side, a typical gamma ray source is a straight line, okay, this red, this red line here. And the other lines you can see that are very curved, the uh, blue one, green one, uh, black one, of course, are gamma ray, uh, sorry, dark matter annihilation spectrum. So dark matter annihilating into gamma rays. And they produce this very, very curved spectra that, as you can see by, by eye, they don't resemble uh, any bit the, the typical gamma ray source, which is, by the way, uh, active galactic nuclear, IGN. If you uh, take a look at the other webinars, you will see this term a lot. So it's very interesting because here nature is telling us you can actually distinguish 
between a, a well-known gamma ray source, a typical gamma ray source, and dark matter annihilation. They are very, very different. And you can see now in the next slide, um, by changing the interaction type and the mass of the particle, this spectrum changes a lot. In the bottom part of this plot, you can see something that puts m equal to 10 GeV, m equal to 100 GeV. This is uh, just varying the mass of the dark matter particle. I told you that the mass is uh, a huge, uh, they have a huge possibility. In this particular model, of course, the, the, the liberty, the freedom is reduced a little bit, but you can have, of course, some, some freedom for the mass. And as you can, you vary the mass, the spectrum, the fingerprint, also varies. So this is very interesting because depending on the uh, fingerprint, the spectrum you detect with CTAO, okay, you can say something about the specific nature of dark matter. You can say, I know that dark matter is this model with this mass. So you can obtain a lot of information. This is absolutely brilliant. And now in the next slide, you can also see that here, we are just changing the interaction type, okay? We have a lot of interactions. If you change the interaction type, you see, that the numbers are the same, one, uh, 10 GeV, 100 GeV, et cetera. But the, the spectrum, the, the shape changed a little bit. So again, depending on the shape and where does it, uh, where does it, where do we found actually this spectrum, we can say this is dark matter, this is the interaction type of the dark matter, and this is the mass of the dark matter particle. So everything basically, and this is marvelous. This is brilliant. So. We have basically everything. We know that dark matter uh, exists. We know uh, some models for it. And we know um, that in some models, we can have gamma rays and how to distinguish them from a typical dark matter uh, gamma ray source. So the question is now, where do we look for dark matter? The thing is that dark, a gamma ray signal in dark matter annihilation is proportional to the square density of dark matter. So the density we have, we need uh, more precisely a very concentrated object, very dark matter dominated systems. And as we want to maximize the gamma ray flux, of course, we need them to be as close as possible. So in this sense, we have galactic and extragalactic targets, targets in our own galaxy and targets far away from our galaxy. So this is the gamma ray sky seen by the Fermilab satellite in eight years of operations, okay? You can see, uh, as in, you may see in other webinars, the prominent uh, central feature there, the red and, and, and yellow band, is our own galaxy. And then you have a uh, lot of sources in the sky, a lot of uh, different uh, things floating around. Now, we can ask ourselves, okay, this is the actual gamma ray sky we are seeing, but if we have only gamma uh, dark matter, how would, how would the, the sky look? So the answer is here in the next slide. Um, this is a simulation, of course. We don't know if we have detected dark matter yet. And you can see that the picture is very different from what we saw in the previous slide, because now we have a, like a spherical feature there, which is the galactic center, and we will hear about it in one minute. And then we have a lot of like point sources around, but we don't have this feature of our own, own galaxy. So it's very different. By comparing these two maps, we can actually say a lot of things about dark matter and hopefully find it. And now, uh, specifically, we can, we can distinguish between many targets. We have the galactic center, the Milky Way halo, nearby galaxies, etc., etc., etc. So many different targets. I will stop here now, and I will leave my colleague Mabel to speak uh, about the galactic center and our interesting galactic targets. Thank you, Javier. Um, uh, yes, uh, so the, the, the first source that we can think about when we try to search for dark matter is very close by to us and it's properly the galactic center, meaning the center of our, of our own galaxy. And uh, this place, the galactic center, actually it's the, the place where we can expect the largest dark matter signal in case of, uh, of, of that uh, we can detect it. Um, so this region happens also to be a very active region full of all kinds of uh, types of sources and of course a lot of gamma ray sources, a lot of diffuse gamma ray emission and so for this reason uh, the Galactic Center is one of the most important targets for uh, CTAOs to, to be observed. Um, so uh, for this reason uh, CTA is preparing a survey of this region uh, that we can see in the next slide uh, 
the distribution of this uh, of this survey, meaning that because this region is extended, CTI will perform a series of different observations to cover all the area. And it will dedicate more than 500 hours of observations of this place, meaning that we will have plenty of uh, data, plenty of observation time from this uh, region to try to search for that matter. Another very interesting source that it's really close by, it's not exactly in our galaxy, but it's really, really close, will be the Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, the Large Magellanic Cloud, the, the Magellanic Clouds are uh, satellites, galaxies from the Milky Way. They can be seen from the southern hemispheres, and they are one of the closest galaxies in our local group. They are located at about 50 kiloparsecs, and they are seen as extended objects from, from the Earth. Um, so these galaxies, which are uh, irregular galaxies, they have uh, a lot of activity in the star uh, formation, uh, which means that they uh, also have a lot of gamma ray sources, uh, like supernova remnants, like pulsar wind nebulae, like binaries and stuff like that. But also happens that uh, uh, we know that they have a huge content of uh, dark matter, like a remarkably huge content. And we know that thanks to studies on their uh, rotational uh, curves. So because they are uh, very interesting objects and they uh, allow us to study galactic physics outside our galaxies, it's also one of the most important uh, goals for, for CTAO. So CTAO will perform also a survey of this uh, region. And we can see uh, uh, in the next slide, like a distribution of, uh, uh, of this, sur this survey, like a preliminary distribution. It will dedicate more than 300 hours of observations uh, to cover all, the, all this extended area. And uh, of course, again, we will uh, collect a lot of data to do our searches for, for dark matter. Um, other nearby sources that we can uh, also study and that are really also close by in our uh, local group will be the galaxies Andromeda M31 and Triangulum M33, uh, which happens to be also very interesting because they are spiral galaxies, meaning they are the same kind of, uh, of galaxy as our own, of our, of, as the Milky Way. And uh, even if they are a little bit more far away than the Magellanic Clouds, they are also um, close enough to be observed as extended objects. So this allow, allow us also to take advantage of the distribution of the dark matter uh, emission to really try to disentangle the, the, the dark matter signal in case uh, there is. Um, OK, so um, how do we search for dark matter in this kind of object? So, um, the problem or the challenge that they present is that, as I said, they are uh, they, they have huge activity in, in like, let's say, in uh, ordinary astrophysics, right? They are full of astrophysical sources, such as supernova remnants, they have binaries, they have pulsar wind nebulae, they have um, the diffuse emission coming from cosmic rays interacting uh, with the interstellar medium. So how do we distinguish uh, the emission of uh, all these sources from the one that comes from the from dark matter um, as javier said uh, dark matter has its, its own spectrum it has its own shape but when we have a very complicated um, source a very complicated target this is not at that easy we have to know very well how the astrophysics of the uh, sources that are present in the target works. Um, and how, how do we do that? Uh, the first thing that we need, uh, as we can see in the next slide, is to build an emission model, an emission model of the gamma ray emission from these sources, meaning the, the gamma rays from the ordinary astrophysical emission. So for example, in the galactic center, which is, um, we can see in the image on the left, these are examples of the different components uh, of the gamma ray emission coming from the galactic center. We can see that there is an extended emission from cosmic rays. There are a lot of small different gamma ray sources which are seen as punctual sources. And there are uh, different kinds of uh, extended emission from cosmic rays interacting from the interstellar medium. So what we need is to put together all these uh, components to predict the, the gamma ray emission that we expect from this direction of the sky, from this target. Um, and then in the case that we can detect any extra signal that cannot be fit with any of these sources, we can then ask us, is this coming from, from dark matter? Um, so 
as we see in the uh, in the next slide um, what we can do then with this extra signal that we in the case that we detect an extra signal of course um, we can uh, try to see if any of the many models of dark matter that exist or that we can uh, afford to to test uh, meaning those models that uh, predict that dark matter will produce gamma rays through annihilation we can try to see uh, if this emission fits to any of these models. So we can say, okay, uh, this emission is compatible with this kind of dark matter model, or maybe uh, it's not, right? Maybe it's not compatible with any of the models that we have. So we can say, okay, then the nature of dark matter is not in this direction. So what we can do is to try different um, annihilation channels. We can try different density profiles, meaning the, how the dark matter mass is distributed in the target. We can try different dark matter masses, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, what happened now? Uh, we don't have data yet, right? Uh, we have to wait for CTAO to be built and to be working and to take all these hours of data to be able to perform these feeds to our emission models. Uh, but uh, still there is a lot of work to do in the meanwhile, right? Um, the first thing will be, of course, to prepare realistic emission models to compare our data with. Uh, to do that, we have to understand very well the, uh, the cosmic ray astrophysics of our sources, our gamma ray astrophysics. So um, we can work at that in the meanwhile, we can build our emission models, and also what we can do is to perform predictions. We can make simulations of the emission of these uh, targets and how uh, CTIO will observe them and, and how CTIO will behave observing these objects. So we can uh, see how sensitive CTIO will be to these kind of targets. And also, um, which dark matter models will be reachable by CTIO because uh, some of them will, don't, will not emit enough, enough uh, light for CTIO to detect them. Other uh, there will be, so we can have an idea of what what can we try to search in the data that we will receive. So regarding these, um, these prospects and these uh, predictions, what we do is to build sensitivity curves that uh, we can see here in the, in the next slide. These sensitivity curves tells us um, a hint on the set of different models that CTA will be able to, to test, to reach. Um, in these curves, what we see is that for uh, different dark matter models, for a different dark matter profile, a different uh, dark matter annihilation channel, a different dark matter mass and the uh, annihilation cross-section, what set of parameters will be reachable by CTA? For example, in the, in the left, you can see different models uh, when CTA is observing to the galactic center. This is all done uh, with simulations. But these curves means that uh, all the models that are above these curves are uh, models that uh, somehow CTA will be able or to detect or to discard in the case that CTA doesn't detect anything uh, compatible with dark matter. Looking in that direction, then we can say, okay, dark matter, it's not um, in this region. And especially, uh, we are very interested in um, in this uh, this uh, blue line that you can see in the in the left uh, plot, and it's a, a dotted red line in the right. This is the thermal cross section. Um, this, this cross section basically defines the set of models inside this weak interactive massive particle theory of dark matter. The set of models that actually will uh, allow to recover the 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 distribution the the density of dark matter that we observe today so we are very very interesting interested in cta to be able to um to prove the models that are in this area and as you can see the galactic center is very promising because a lot of models uh, a lot of sensitivity curves are below this area in the large magellanic cloud which is the curves in the in the right as you see it's more complicated because the large magellanic clouds are farther away they are complicated objects with a lot of sources and this can difficult uh, our task so uh, as a summary of, uh, of this part, um, these close by uh, dark matter targets are very interesting because they have high content of dark matter and because they are very close uh, to us, we can expect strong dark matter annihilation signals. The problem is that they also have strong backgrounds, strong gamma ray backgrounds from other uh, gamma ray sources that are present there. So uh, what we have to do is to perform big efforts together with the galactic and cosmic ray science groups inside CTA and also in collaboration with other uh, 
experiments with our institutes in order to be able to understand these backgrounds to build a proper and very realistic emission models which allow which will allow us to really study the dark matter and uh, now uh, my colleague Judith will tell you more about uh, other sources, other targets for dark matter farther away. Yes, so Mabel has already told us about uh, some targets that are indeed non-galactic, like for example these nearby galaxies, but now we are going to talk about other interesting extragalactic sources of gamma ray uh, from dark matter origin which can be galaxy clusters and dwarf spheroidal galaxies, for example. So first of all, we are going to talk about dwarf spheroidal galaxies. Indeed, Mabel has already introduced them. And OK, as its name said, uh, dwarf spheroidal galaxies are really small galaxies, which usually are companion galaxies to other big galaxies. Class, for example, in our neighborhood, we can find satellite the dwarf spheroidal galaxies which are, are accompanying like the Milky Way and M31. Uh, but however they weren't discovered until 1938. So how can it be? So according to a structure formation history of the universe, these dwarf spheroidal galaxies are the first one to be formed. So after all these formation history processes, these very small galaxies and being cannibalized by the bigger uh, galaxies. So the remaining ones are still not a lot of them. And they host like a very old population of stars which appear to be very faint. And also they do not host uh, any kind of hot, uh, hot dust or hot gas. So they really appear to be very faint in the sky. However, in the, from the information that we will get from the future uh, uh, telescopes and the future observation, uh, it's expected to be discovering more of this kind of object. Another interesting thing from them is that uh, their stars that they host are not in rotation, so we cannot provide rotation curves from, from most of these objects. And the way we have to measure the mass and their properties is to try to measure these random motions the, the stars that they host uh, go through in them. So we call that the dwarf spiral galaxies are pressure supported system. And talking about the mass, uh, just uh, these objects are of the order of a million times in the light of the case, the uh, mass of uh, half the mass of the sun. And Aside from being an extragalactic object, they are the nearest to us, uh, being always uh, less than 1.5 uh, million light years from us. However, because they are really small, they appear as a point sources in the sky. Okay, so having this in mind, being this uh, uh, small and to this distance, in order to account for the mass, of these galaxies, we need a thousand times more dark matter than standard matter, meaning that we have one of these best conditions that Javier, Javier was mentioning before of having a very strong dominated dark matter object. Taking this into account, we have more than uh, enough in order to point our, tele our telescopes to dwarf sorry, dwarf galaxies. But the other thing that it's very good from these objects, uh, in contrast to what we have seen from galactic objects, is that we do not expect any other kind of gamma ray emission from this object that it's not coming from dark matter. So it will be really a smoking on to detect any kind of dark matter emission from a dark spheroidal galaxy. As Mabel has told us, uh, here we have uh, some prospects on sensitivity curves of the planet's observation of the, sorry, <laughs> things, uh, of the observations that uh, are expected to be performed with CTA. We expect a hundred hour on uh, each different uh, dwarf spheroidal that will be targeted as best candidate. And even though we wouldn't be able in principle to reach the same level of exclusion that we have uh, with, for example, the Galactic Center, we uh, still it's important to have this universal and complementarity uh, between different objects. Now that we know about dwarf spheroidal, let's go to the other extreme, 
that is galaxy clusters. Galaxy clusters are the largest gravitationally bound structures in the universe, and one will naively think that they are pretty stable objects. However, these are the last structures that I formed in the history formation of the universe. So we can get some clusters that are pretty stable, like the one we have in the left side, which is the Perseus cluster, where we can see in color the distribution of the mass with this very pretty spherical is symmetrical. And then in the right hand side, we have the Bollock cluster, when we can clearly see these two front shocks in the distribution of the mass that tell us about the history of the cluster and is telling us that it has gone through some major event really recently. Now, more things about galaxy clusters is that, uh, in contrast to dwarf cereal, they host galaxies which account mostly up to 5% of the galaxy cluster mass. They also host a lot of active galactic nuclei, this uh, very well known source of gamma ray emission, and they also have plenty of hot gas and dust, which is usually called the intercluster medium. And this intercluster medium is usually exposed to some very strong magnetic fields, to a lot of turbulence that end accelerating these particles that are in the hot gas and dust and creating cosmic rays. So you also will know about cosmic rays if you check on this past webinars of the series. And from these cosmic rays, we also expect gamma ray emission. What is, uh, I would say, curious about it is that is, despite expecting them, we haven't detected any kind of gamma ray emission from galaxy clusters. So just the detection of gamma ray emission from a galaxy cluster will be a very big achievement, not only for CTA, but for the whole astrophysical community. Regarding the characteristics, galaxy clusters are in the in the lightest case a uh, billion times uh, the mass of the sun and well they are not so close to us the closest to us will be the virgo cluster which is the 49 mm, million light years to us and but they can appear as a really extended object to us for example the virgo the virgo cluster it has a radius of eight degrees in the sky but some of them that are pretty far from us will just appear as a point like However, did you remember that I told you that galaxies in the galaxy cluster only account to 5% of its mass? Okay, this hot dust and hot gas only accounts for the 15% of its mass. So the rest, this 80% rest, is in form of dark matter. So are huge, uh, hugely dark matter dominated objects. So this is more than enough to point again our telescopes to galaxy clusters, and also are the perfect environment to not test only, for example, this annihilation scenario model that we've been talking about, but also to test other kind of models. For example, this decay dark matter model in which we assume that a dark matter particle can indeed decay into two standard model particles. For this case, a CTA uh, is planning to observe uh, the Perseus galaxy cluster, for uh, 300 hours, and we will perform exactly the same kind of analysis that Mabel was telling to, was telling to us. We were aiming for a detection, and in case uh, we do not detect the gamma rays or is not from dark matter, we were able, we are going to be able to reject some models which will be no longer compatible with our observations. Last but not least, I wanted to also talk about this very light components of the dark matter, these, these models that was introduced in Javier before, which are the axions. The axions, as Javier has told, uh, have a mass of a billion times the one of the electron. So they are really, really some light particles and were introduced in the standard model of particle physics in order to solve some problem related to the strong force. However, in some models, these axions or axion-like particles are expected to be coupled to the gamma rays, are expected to be coupled to the light. And in these models, we can see that uh, these axions can be converted into gamma rays and other way around in the presence of strong magnetic fields. And just for you to know, uh, our universe is full of the strongest magnetic fields that we have. So what we can do with CTA is to point to very well known um, source of gamma rays, like for example, these AGNs, which are also extragalactic, and 
to reconstruct the bath of a gamma ray that has been emitted from one of these AGNs through all the magnetic fields and all of the changes that we have gone uh, turning into this process of conversion into an axion, and then try to, reco to recover the signal. And again, in case that we are not able to, to detect this gamma ray, what we can do again is just to exclude in this uh, plot, as we can see on the right hand side, uh, the, the models that are no longer compatible with the observation that CTA is expected to perform. So just to wrap up everything that we have talked, uh, their matter nature, despite mainly a hundred years of studying, is still unknown. We have a huge range of different kind of models with different characteristics and properties with different range of masses going to very, very light masses like the actions that I just told you to these primordial black holes, which are no longer uh, point like particles, just macroscopic objects. And it's very important to have this complementarity between the different ways we want to detect dark matter. There is dark people that is trying to uh, produce dark matter at the Large Hadron Collider and also other experiments in Earth that are trying to measure that if uh, dark matter is able to interact in this weekly uh, sense with the standard matter. And then we have our channel, which is indirect detection, which is detection of dark matter uh, through his annihilation. And there's still plenty of astrophysical sources to be exploring in, in gamma rays and a lot of work to do in order to know, for example, these backgrounds that we have for galactic sources or even characterize better the objects that are extragalactic, like these red dwarf galaxies that we know from very recently. And um, for this, we will have a CTAO, which is the future of the gamma ray astronomy. So thanks a lot, uh, Judith, uh, for this super nice and detailed overview. I would like to ask Javier and Mabel to join us and congratulate you too. I, I have to say, I really enjoy the, the <laughs> webinar. So for the people that is watching us, just uh, as a reminder, we are going to start the question and answer session. So if you have any questions about what uh, they they explain or you have a question you had before, this is the time. Send it through the comments on Facebook and YouTube. Um, meanwhile, uh, I would like to actually ask myself some questions to you. I would like actually to start with Javier, who was the first one. You uh, briefly mentioned a source whose name just popped up for me, that it was primordial black holes. I don't know if maybe you can delve into that because I'm kind of curious what is that? What is the difference between a normal black hole we normally hear about and primordial black holes and why they are a target for dark matter? Yes, so thanks for the question because it's really interesting and it's a topic I like to, to talk a lot about. I think we could do like five uh, webinars on primordial black holes because it's a very vast uh, topic. But very quickly, um, what we think we know about black holes is that they are produced by the collapse of, of stars at the end of its life, or its life cycle. Uh, the pressure of the star cannot counteract its own weight and it collapses. And it's if the star is very, very, very heavy, it uh, collapses a uh, big time into a black hole. This is what we think we know about black holes. But there is another theory there uh, around from the early 70s, I think it's, it's, it was proposed, that are primordial black holes and are, that these kind of objects can be produced by stellar collapse, but also can be produced in the very early universe through uh, fluctuations of density. Uh, the, the universe, it, it goes through a, the so-called inflationary phase, which is a very violent phase in which the universe is expanding exponentially, crazy. And these fluctuations can lead to actually um, very, very, very uh, compact objects, which are primordial black holes. And the thing is that primordial black holes can effectively behave as dark matter under certain conditions. And more interestingly, they can uh, evapor evaporate through the so-called Hawking radiation due to the late Stephen Hawking. And this means that black holes can actually emit some particles in the last steps of, of their life. 
and can actually emit gamma rays. So CTAO, in principle, could even detect some gamma rays coming from these primordial black holes. So these are very, very interesting targets, very exotic objects, but very interesting nevertheless. And maybe th this question goes to, to another speaker, maybe uh, uh, Mabel. Um, how can we be sure that we detect gamma ray 100% from this source or to another source? I think Javier already kind of explained, but uh, I, 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 the point is it could be possible to misinterpret the data to that that would be another source or something. Yes, well, <laughs> the quick answer will be that we can not be 100% sure, like in science, it's very difficult to reassure that something is something. <laughs> in the case of, of uh, dark matter, um, what we have to do is that we have to relay on other, uh, other kind of science. As you did say, there are many ways to try to detect dark matter. There is direct way, indirect way, etc. So in the case that by uh, luckily we detect some signal that it's compatible to any of our models. For example, we detect a signal and we see that it's compatible with one of the spectrum of dark matter. So we can say, okay, we think that this might be dark matter. Okay, then uh, we need from uh, the support of the uh, scientific community, from other experiments, from experiments from the earth, from experiments from direct detection for the production of dark matter to really confirm or uh, to really confirm that this uh, model of dark matter is actually possible and that our signal it's really uh, um, a true a true signal from from dark matter. So that that will be the way to go. Perfect, thanks. And then actually um, kind of discussing this part of, of maybe misinterpreted that it's difficult to, to detect. And so um, a question to Judith, um, you were talking about the galaxy clusters, which are the biggest structures that we have in the universe. And you were talking about them like a whole uh, source that you would like to observe and so, but um, shouldn't we consider the things that they are hosting in order to, to be sure we're detecting dark matter, why uh, the whole galaxy cluster? That's a very good point. And this leads me also to, to the fact that galaxy clusters host galaxies and maybe something else, right? Because we know from dark matter simulations that we expect from this history formation of the universe, the smallest structure, for example, this Rasperova is very dark to form spheres. And then by accretion, collapse, and really violent uh, uh, processes, they form these biggest objects. So as Javier was mentioned, we want to look for sources which are really concentrated because the dependence on the, the on the gamma ray flux that we expect from dark matter annihilation is it's dependent with the square of the density. So of course, in order to make this prospect and also to quantify in a re reliable way the amount of gamma rays that we need, we need to model also the gamma ray annihilation that we expect from these inner galaxies, or what we usually call subhalos and substructures. Great. I, I just see a uh, uh, question, so I'm going to do it very fast because, sorry, we are running uh, late. But we have a question, a more technical one from Richard Newstead. He, uh, I, I guess he's excited to know when CTAO is uh, likely to have the, the first light. So, well, maybe I can answer from the perspective of CTO, actually, Richard. Uh, uh, next uh, year, we will uh, start the construction phase. It would take, well, once the ERIC, the, the, the new entity, the European one, is established, the construction is going to start, and it will take uh, uh, around uh, five years. But obviously the, the data it will be taken. Actually, Mabel, you're working on the large size telescope prototype. Maybe you can say something from the, the first uh, uh, telescope we have already in place. Well, uh, from the first telescope, we already have uh, some data that has been very uh, analyzed and, and it's been very successful actually. 
it's been taking data for now maybe a couple of years, um, but in the latest uh, year, we have observed many different sources and it's very interesting. Um, and I hope, and probably for the next telescope is going to be faster, right? Because always the first ones, it's, you, it's when you have all the problems, but then once you know that your uh, telescope works, I think the next will be much more quick. And by the moment that we have more than one uh, and we can observe in a stereo, that will be awesome. <laughs> a lot of data, a lot of interesting science that we can start doing even with just um, it, even with uh, just some telescope and not all the, the, the array. Yeah, I think we are all excited to, to see the data, not only from one, but from, the, from, uh, from all the, the array, the sensitivity, all the curves that you, you show, that is going to be amazing. Uh, okay, we have another question. Um, I would like to do it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I know it's late. But uh, Malvermudet asks, can dark matter be composed by antimatter? So whoever wants to answer, maybe Javier, you start also talking about the decays and so. Yes, so short answer, unfortunately not. We would love to because we will have uh, our, our mind much, much quieter, but it's not. Um, the problem is that antimatter is very, very similar to matter actually. It comes from the same uh, process, let's say. If you have a positron, which is antimatter, it's the antimatter of the electron. But you can also see this from the perspective that electron is the anti-positron. So they are uh, symmetric under this, under this change. Uh, actually, dark matter uh, interaction, as we saw, produce cosmic rays. And cosmic rays are also antimatter. So antimatter is well known since uh, more than 100 years ago, since the times of Paul Dirac. So it's very well studied and unfortunately cannot be dark matter because it, it doesn't fulfill the, the, the things we need for dark matter to behave the way we know. But it would be very, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thanks again, guys. I think this was the, the longest webinar we have. I really enjoy, I have to say. Um, and we are going to finish already here. I would like to thank you again. Thank also the, the audience that join us and just remind them that we have uh, next uh, month another stop in this journey through the extreme universe. We're going to talk about transients, the most powerful sources that we have in our universe. So do not forget to subscribe to our Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all the social medias in order to stay tuned. So thanks again and see you next month. Ciao, ciao.